recognises that different frequency sends a message to our brain, to our, our, our climactory um, segments in our brain, and that send, and our brain then registers it, oh, that's green, that's blue, that's red, and so on. And that's how it all happens. This is here a spectrum. I put this on here for twofold. One is to show you the actual wavelengths, what you're looking at, visible light. Wavelengths is about 400 nanometers to about 700 nanometers. Anything from one meter onwards is considered radio waves. From about one millimeter through to one, one meter is considered as microwaves. Between the two, you've got your infrared and you've got your violet, ultraviolet rather, and your X rays and your gamma rays right up in here. So you're talking wavelengths. A nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 of a meter, in other words, 0. 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 9 times. And you're talking 10 to the minus 5 nanometers. So that's, oh, so that's 0. 14 zeros with a 1, and that's the wavelength. So it's a pretty small wavelength right over here. We get a wavelength from radio waves up to here, that's, what, that's a kilometre. So that gives you an idea, you know, it just puts the perspective of a huge spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. Now, as mentioned, our um, sun spits out most of its uh, electromagnetic radiation in this part of the spectrum just here. And our eyes have obviously evolved, because if you're more efficient than <coughs> recognizing light and responding to light in those wavelengths, you, you're going to obviously um, you know, survive better and reproduce and so on. So evolution has created us whereby our eyes are really, really honed in to the range of light that our star, the sun, produces mostly of. Now, so what causes light? The bottom line is light is caused by isolating or moving charged particles. Every atom, every molecule and particle usually has some sort of charge attached to it, positive and a negative and so on. And everything is moving around all the time. And the faster something's moving, the more energy it's got, the higher energy electromagnetic radiation is going to produce. <coughs> so it follows that you get some really high, highly energetic process going on with high speeds of particles and molecules smashing into one another. They're going to give out like your gamma rays and your X-rays and your ultraviolet versus something where molecules are going really, really slowly. They're going to be giving out your microwaves and your radio waves and your infrared. And I was telling someone that the other day that everything around us, everything <coughs> is moving, is in motion. Nothing sits still. These walls are moving, the chairs are moving, the carpet, there's little molecules moving around. So in short, the take-home message from tonight is the universe is one big party. Everything's grooving and rocking and rolling and motioning around there. So when you're going out the door at 11 o'clock at night, you fatty are you going out to another party? You say, hey, I'm doing my bit for the universe, leave me alone, all right? You're grooving with the universe. The universe is one big party. That's what's going on. So, for example, what's going on in this room? The electrical current is coming through, going through filaments which is of a certain temperature, which is shooting at light, which is mainly visible light. It's coming out, it's reflecting off these surfaces in the sea. Turn the light switches off, put an infrared to all those night goggles on, you see all of us would be glowing in the infrared because our molecules are moving, we're breathing and moving, all the molecules in our skin that are giving off ultra, it's an infrared radiation that we can't see with our eyes because it's too weak, but you put your night goggles on, you can see it. Similarly, these chairs, this carpet, are all giving out microwaves, we just can't see it. But everything's moving, everything is emitting electromagnetic radiation. And what is temperature? Temperature is just, you might think, what is temperature? I remember years ago thinking about this as a kid, what is temperature? What are they talking about this temperature? Temperature is just a, 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 an arbitrary measure of the kinetic energy or motion of molecules and particles. That's all it is. <clears throat> Don't get too hung up on it. So there's three main scales. There's the Celsius, which is based on the properties of water. water yeah. So they just decided, okay, water, water's freezing at this. We're going to call this zero degrees. Let's boil it up at sea level, boils up at sea level, right? we're going to make that 100 degrees Celsius, and it will split it all up, and, and that's what the Celsius scale is all based on. It's based on sea level um, freezing and boiling temperatures of water. Kelvin the scale is based on the properties of yeah, particle physics and stuff. Yeah, the real life, what's going on. Well, I'll come to absolute zero in a minute. Yeah. So it's talking about the properties of particle physics, the actual absolute motion of, of particles. And it's, always, it's, it's designed whereby it's the same scale as Celsius. It so happens 
that at zero degrees Celsius matches with 273 degrees Kelvin. So 100 degrees Celsius is obviously 273 plus 100, it's just exactly the same. One degree Celsius is 273 plus one, 274 degrees Kelvin. So that's all there is there, and it goes right down to zero, so I'm gonna loot in here, and you get down to absolute zero. And they call it absolute zero because nothing, you cannot achieve absolute zero. That, that's inferring that there's no motion going on whatsoever. Everything in the universe is in motion. The universe is one big party. Get used to it. <laughs> if things stop, the whole universe would collapse. <clears throat> That's why absolute zero, you cannot have it. The equations and the functions just collapse. So how do they compare? And that's pretty much what I've mentioned here. The Kelvin, the actually, I'll tell you actually what I get. What is the Fahrenheit made? Who can tell what the Fahrenheit is based on? Now, it's actually, it was in 1724, there was a professor, a German professor, Professor von Fahrenheit, I don't know about the von bits of stuff, but Yeah, his father, mate, this is how he takes the temperature, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and he got br a brine solution, the properties of a brine solution, it was water, ice, and ammonium chloride, and, uh, and he just took it by the freezing and boiling water of those, so in terms of converting, here it is here, Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit get Celsius, Multiply it by 1.8 and add 32. <coughs> How bizarre and crazy is that? But the Americans still use it, and they seem pretty happy with themselves. <laughs> Don't know the president, but they're pretty happy with themselves. <coughs> and why am I talking all about this? Because one of the things I'm leading into is different objects in astronomy and different astronomical processes in space, as we've pretty much talked about, produce light in different wavelengths. So it makes sense if you're going to be observing and, and making discoveries and important observations of processes and objects in space, you've really got to be open to observing light in all wavelengths. For example, here's a gamma ray burst. You've had a massive star um, <coughs> that's uh, collapsed, it's, it collapsed itself here, greater than 20, um, uh, 20 solar masses. It's collapsed itself here um, and it's giving off a gamma ray burst. There's high energy radiation going out here in a bipolar sort of uh, fashion. And that's gamma rays, highly, you know, so you know immediately some hugely high energetic event occurred here. Then you get to the supernova remnant that's left over after your massive star collapse. And when you put your X-ray telescope there, such as the Chandra, that is what you see. You just see a big ball of X-rays being emitted. So you know something pretty energetic is going on here, some sort of process. Not as energetic as that process, but still pretty energetic. So it makes sense. You want to be checking out all these different wavelengths. This is one of my favourite pictures, the Pillars of Creation. It's a very iconic picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, it's in the middle of M16, isn't it? The Eagle Nebula. And this is an invisible wavelength. This is what you see with the visible cameras. And you can see these bright new young stars here blazing away in ultraviolet. And you see these big pillars of gas and dust sitting up here. You look at that same image, but with a infrared sensor on board that picks up infrared. Look what you see through that's covered in these big shrouds of gas and dust, you see here a whole stack of new stars forming that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Because you can start seeing through all the gas and dust. So it makes sense you really want to be you want to be aware of and seeing the different wavelengths. So how does the atmosphere affect observations? The bottom line is apart from visible light and patches of the large patches of the radio waves, the atmosphere actually absorbs and scatters most light, electromagnetic radiation. Pretty much absorbs all of gamma rays, x-rays, and ultraviolet. You can see this little wee window here, actually visible. So we're very fortunate that visible get through the atmosphere. Here's your infrared, some get through, some doesn't. Here's then you're getting through into your uh, uh, microwaves and onto your radio waves. So you can see there, apart from some radio waves and apart from the visible light, most of all your light that's coming from outside is getting blocked by the atmosphere. So, hence, space telescopes. And I've got a whole two talks on space telescopes, parts one and two. Um, so we'll do part one next time. And um, see, so for example, you've got the Fermi space satellite that, that's designed to detect gamma rays from space above the atmosphere. You've got that, the Chandra X-ray, which I'm doing a project on at the moment. I'm pulling apart bolt by bolt and nut by nut. So that's the Chandra telescope that views the universe in X-rays. Then you've got the Hubble, ultraviolet, visible, and infrared. 
So you might say, well, hey guys, we've got the radio telescopes on Earth, we've got dishes, we've got between the Fermi and the Charter and the Hubble, haven't we got everything else covered? Now we're above the atmosphere. Why, why even bother with a ground-based telescope? <clears throat> well, there's two reasons why, despite having space telescopes that get above our biggest hurdle, namely the atmosphere, you still want your ground-based telescopes. Two key reasons. One, size. Size is everything with observing and astronomy. Don't go to Andrew when you go to buy your astronomy telescope and say, Oh, what's the magnification? He'd have a heart attack. You're going to have to do CPR on the poor guy. <laughs> he wants you to ask the question, how big is your aperture? How big is your primary mirror? It's all about size. Because a bigger size telescope gives a better brightness to an image, which means if something's really faint, you're more likely to see it with a bigger aperture. And we talk about aperture, diameter, primary mirror, all one and the same. Don't get mixed up between the two. Everyone's referring about the same thing. So if you get a bigger diameter mirror slash aperture to your telescope, you're going to get a brighter image, which means you're capable of seeing something a lot fainter than perhaps someone else's smaller telescope. Your resolution is going to be better. In other words, your ability to, to uh, determine fine little details, to focus in and separate detail um, within that particular object you're looking at. So size is everything when it comes down to telescopes. And of course, size, is, you can build them, you know, you, you have, space telescopes are expensive to develop and they're expensive to launch. Um, so it's a huge disadvantage. So they usually can only get up to a certain sort of standard size. Like the Hubble is only 2.4 meter um, mirror in, in it. So you're very much limited with space telescopes. Yeah, try and put one of these babies in space. Yeah, go ahead, I'll, I'll watch it with interest. <coughs> So size is the big advantage. The other thing is new technology. Ground-based telescopes are far easier to service, maintain them, and upgrade as new technology comes along. Notwithstanding the Hubble, and even then they've only done four missions over about 28 years to service it, but all the other te bunch of telescopes up there, you know, they're usually in orbits which are not really able to get to to do servicing and so on. As opposed to one of these ground-based telescopes, yep, you can service it, you can maintain it, new technology comes along, Absolutely not a problem, as long as you're paying for it. <coughs> so speaking of new technology, um, one of the, I've mentioned one of the big hurdles that, is that atmosphere causes turbulence, which causes disturbing what they call singing and stuff. All these ground-based telescopes these days with new technology have got, a, have got a, a process called adaptive optics, whereby they shine lasers, this is the uh, Keck telescopes, are the first to use this technology, they shine a laser up into the sky, high into the atmosphere. They excite sodium atom, atoms really high up in the atmosphere. The, side, the excited sodium atoms then emit light of a known quality. They observe them, and from then the telescope can measure the amount of turbulence, objectively measure the amount of tur turbulence going on, and then correct and counter with their mirrors, just al make little alterations to the mirror, to counter the turbulence that's going on, such that they're now seeing things, their image on, on their recorders is exactly what it would be like without that atmosphere. So consider this, the, the Keck mirrors are 10 metres large. So what's that, the size of this room? 10 by 10 metres, roughly? It's the size, of course. So it's huge big mirrors. Those mirrors are sensing the light coming back from the excited sodium and adjusting the mirrors, little segments of the mirrors, 2,000 times per second. How crazy is that? That's how accurate. And it's to an accuracy of 4 nanometers. Two, a 10 by 10 meter mirror. It's quietly adjusting. They've got little segments in them. And they're quietly adjusting themselves to an accuracy of 4 nanometers, 2,000 times per second. That's sort of the technology you're talking about. The tech, the optics on the tech, can outperform the optics in the Hubble telescope. Except these guys have got a 10 meter telescope as a mirror as opposed to 2.4. So you can obviously see that's been a big advantage on the ground. Big mirrors, wait for new technology to come along, slap the new technology and go, ha, gotcha, Hubble. Ah. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> and you can drive to it. Yeah, and you, and you can drive to it, yeah. And eat chips on the way up. Eat chips. <laughs> I need the chips because the chip bag with crispy bags. And you have them in the vehicle like that with some packs and lunches. And about halfway up the mountain, he runs and goes, bang, bang, and the bus oh, yeah. chips are exploding. Yeah. <laughs> we we'll reject that was very impressive. Oh, I'll get my trills cheaply. 
Okay, so um, the other thing is, as we mentioned about before, 90% of the water vapor lies below 3,000 litres. So, so don't write off, this is interesting, I spell right off, anyway, but never mind. Don't write off my spelling, guys. Don't write off around those telescopes for observing the near infrared. And that's another little thing, like regions then split up into smaller regions, like the infrared's broken into the near infrared, which means close to visible, the mid infrared, and the far infrared. But certainly, you get these telescopes up high with their big fat mirrors and the new technology, um, such as adaptive optics, they can start, they're above that water, 90% of the water vapor, they can start observing the universe in near infrared wavelengths. And that opens up a whole lot of more astronomical processes going on, like protoplanetary disks, exoplanets, and so on. Chris, sorry. Yes. Yeah. In that photo, there's a, a fantastic shadow of a mountain on the, on the cloud Oh. That does look beautiful in here. Yeah. Yeah. It's either that or a big pyramid out there for the alien. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite cool. The alien knows it. An iPod image of this here uh, um, mm. a few weeks or months ago. Mm. And they're explaining how it, it, the perspective effect rather than a shadow of a pointy mountain. Sure, yes. So yes. the shadow is the mountain going far, far away. So quite the perspective is just like a Yeah, yeah it does. Thank you. Yeah, that's cool. Mm. On, on a flat head. Yeah, yep. So what is, I used that word for interferometry. Like <coughs> marmalade. Well, bar. What inter interferometry is another bit of new technology whereby multiple telescopes are set out in a huge large array, you get the signal from each individual telescope, it gets processed by supercomputers, and you then synthesize a signal as if it's coming from a telescope the size of that big array. It <coughs> involves a lot of technology, essentially, the signals are combined and amplified. And as mentioned, yeah, it involves a lot of supercomputing to go and process it all, but effectively increases the size of the telescope to the size of the array for the resolution. Remember I mentioned that incre uh, it, you increase the size of your telescope, you increase brightness and resolution. So the resolution is because of just the, the size of your array, so that remains, th uh, that, so that gets pumped up, but your brightness doesn't get pumped up, because your brightness comes down to the actual size of the collecting, the actual collecting area. So you actually haven't got a telescope that big. So brightness doesn't increase, but resolution, your ability to resolve fine detail, does improve as if you had a telescope the size of your entire array. It's usually seen in radio telescopes. Keck did use it throughout the early 90s, through to about 98, 1999. Um, and, and then they found it was, uh, it was very expensive to upkeep. Um, they lost their funding for it because they had other priorities and so on. And they found they were tying up two very good optical telescopes, so they, they, they didn't got with this. But it's usually seen in radio telescopes. It's another example of technology you can do with ground telescopes you can't do with space telescopes. Here's a really um, exact extreme example recently, the Event Horizon Telescope, where they've got eight telescopes in different places spread out throughout, throughout the Earth. And they combine that signal as if they had a radio telescope the size of planet Earth. And they were able to uh, look at the supermassive black hole at the heart of um, the galaxy M87, a large elliptical galaxy in the uh, Virgo cluster. And that's what they saw. <coughs> so that was taken as if they had a radio telescope the size of the Earth. So that's the most extreme example of an inferometry. There is talk of making plans of maybe putting out a radio telescope or something sort, perhaps out in space or something like that to increase that even further. So, summary so far. Light is generated by moving particles. The universe is one big party. Everything's in motion. Everything's producing electromagnetic radiation. And you measure that by measuring the temperature, which tells you what sort of radio waves you're dealing with, what sort of uh, wavelengths you're dealing with, and the temperature and the, and the kinetic energy of the particles. So light comes in a, a range of wavelengths, which reflects the energy and the temperature, as mentioned. Um, and of course that reflects different processes that are going on, astronomical <coughs> objects and processes. The atmosphere unfortunately absorbs and distorts most wavelengths. Space telescopes are, the, are a great answer to that. You get above the atmosphere and start looking at a much wider range. But there still is a place for ground telescopes. They can be much, much larger. Just put them up in high places. You can get above a lot of the water vapour. You can use new technology like adaptive optics and interferometry to 
counter some of the effects of the atmosphere. Um, and suddenly you've opened up, you've got much better optical vision, that's visual wavelengths it's referring to. You can look at the near infrared, and certainly the radio waves with interferometry, you can start looking at those wavelengths with a lot of precision because of just upgrade technology and sheer size you can do from ground telescopes. So as you can see, there's obviously a place for, for both in here. And the next two talks are going to be on space telescopes. So that's where we are so far. So what are these Keck, the ESO and the Ulmer Observatories? This is what I did in the holidays. So here's the Keck Observatory, two telescopes, Keck 1 and Keck 2. And you can see it's remote, so the summit of Mauna Kea. Um, that's in Hawaii, and you're talking, it's elevated, it's over 4,000 metres or 1,400 feet, which we often still think of, I think, because of the air travel and what have you. Is that the Subaru one to the left here? Uh, no, I think the Subaru one was on another one. Another peak, is it? Yeah, there, actually, another peak here. Okay. Yep. But there's the Subaru, there's the Gemini North up there, there's always a lot. In fact, there's really two main observations, number of them, but the two big observational sites in the world in the northern hemisphere is the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, and there's a huge just a ray of them up there, and then the Atacama Desert, where all the great southern observatories are. Uh, so keep one or two here, they have 10 metre primary mirrors that are able to visible, uh, view the universe in the visible and near infrared. And this is the telescope, what it looks like here. It's called uh, the optical design, it's what they call a Ritchie, um, um, Kreepkin optical design, and whereby well, it's, a, it's, sort of, it's a, uh, a variation of what they call a Cassegrain. You've probably heard of that before. Light comes in through here, hits the 10 metre primary mirror, and you can see here it's broken into segments 36 little segments, and all those segments can sense what the guy next to it's doing, and so on. And other things that adjust themselves 2,000 times per second to the degree of 4 nanometers. The light hits the primary mirror, goes back up to the secondary mirror. And remember that infrared light, longer wavelengths than the visible light? So it's actually got two primary, two secondary mirrors up here. You've got a close one for optical or visual wavelengths, and just a little bit further behind it, you've got your infrared secondary mirror because you're having to focus at different lengths. The light from either one, depending on what they're interested in on that particular night, then comes back through here, actually cover here, one, come back through that centre thing there. And you, you're probably familiar with what they call a Cassegrain focus, which is you, the, most of the telescopes you see focuses behind the telescope there. You're looking back here. That's called your, your classical Cassegrain focus. But you start dealing in big equipment, which I'm going to show you some, some shortly, like some huge big um, CCD cameras and spectroscopes and stuff. They're talking, some of this equipment's half the size of these rooms, really heavy. You can't have those sitting on the end of your telescope very really. So they have these big platforms out to the side. And there's a concept um, called having a foci off to the side. This is called a Nasmuth um, foci, where you've got a tertiary mirror that gets the light signal and shuts it off to the side there. And you have these platforms where you can have stationed all your big heavy instruments without putting an extra load on the telescope structure. So that's why they have a tertiary telescope. There's another one called a, um, Kudo, a Kudo focus, where it gets the lights get shunted out to the side back down, sort of like an elbow. Cune is French for elbow, so sort of the light gets bent and doubled down. Mm -hmm. Once again, it's all about ha handling these huge big sort of uh, weights of, uh, the, of the, all the big sensors and spectroscopes and stuff. So, and that's, uh, we've talked about Nesmith focuses, we've talked about that. Yeah, so that's, that's the Keck telescopes, what they look like. And yet, of course, it's a handy place to put your eyepiece there if you want to look through it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the um, we mentioned interferometry. So this is the two telescopes that it looks like underground, they're all connected there. Um, the basis between the two of them when they did the interferometry was as if they had an 85 metre diameter telescope when they hooked the two up together. So that did produce some amazing science, but it was just so expensive, it's pretty complex for the stuff, and they didn't get the funding for it, so they dropped it. Now these are some of the pictures that I took with my telescope, my oil mark telescope, with my camera when I was there. And here's your 10 metre primary mirror. Here's your little sequence through here. That's, uh, and this is it's looking through here. That's your, um, your secondary mirror above it. It gets a bit, actually, um, you start losing your, uh, your whole perspective on it. 
So that's your big primary mirror there you're looking at. That's your secondary mirror. So you've got your, um, your secondary optical mirror there, and here you've got your, um, your infrared secondary mirror. It's more like bouncing from the primary mirror that's focused onto that. And then goes down through the tertiary mirror here. This is a picture of me, it's a reflection of me. I'm actually standing behind the secondary telescope taking a picture and you're seeing a reflect I'm seeing a reflection of myself in the primary mirror and the tertiary mirror at the same time. <clears throat> so the tertiary mirror can open up, let light go straight through to the classical cassegrain focus, or it can shut it off the size to the side to one of those NASNET focuses to one of the you know, really large instruments they have off the side of the telescope. That lady there is, is um, Pamela Gay. I don't know if people know pa Pamela Gay, she's a famous astronomer who does a lot of those things with Alan Fraser and stuff like the universe today and all those public relation things in the US. So she was on our, uh, on our conference with us. So I just saw it, I took the pictures, I thought that's Pamela. Here's just in sort of, there's workstations everywhere. By the way, this is not, the, the main workstations are further down the mountain um, where, the, uh, where the astronomers can be a bit more relaxed and sort of not, not have to worry about your oxygen so much. Um, this, there's numerous stations dotted around, but it was mainly for the telescope engineers, the local TR's telescope operators. It's a whole career of business in itself, engineers running the show. There's always an astronomer up there, one or two astronomers just busy overseeing whatever they have to be doing that particular night. So there's about six of these stations dotted around, around the place. Speaking of oxygen, we had a little oximeter to measure oxygen levels. And like all of us now, we're chatting on about 98, 99% oxygen moments getting into those systems if you put the little meter on, on your fingers. Um, so we had one up there so we took it. And I think I was chugging one about 85 or something like that. Normally you send someone to the hospital and about 91, 90, you started getting them to the hospital. <laughs> we were charging around at about 85 and it was like being drunk and we were like kids so we just of course we were excited too so we were just bouncing off the walls and having sort of a semi delirious day having fun. It was, it was great. <coughs> so that's one of the workstations. That's one of the workstations there they're constantly watching uh, weather conditions and so on, so it's little temperatures and stuff. So it's just some of the snapshot on the screen there. So then we moved on. Okay, so last or the early this year, rather, we went to Chile to see the total solar eclipse. Here's the Chile site up here. Um, the Southern European Observatory actually consists of three different sites. You've got the Chile site sitting about here, array of telescopes. That's the picture I took just going up the mountain, uh, and then further up. Who's in that James Bond movie? The, um, what's it called? Quantum of Solace. Quantum of Solace, Quantum of Solace, Solace yeah. yeah. And it was all filmed in that really cool sort of setting. That was at the Paranar Very Large Telescope, which is sitting up about here in the Atlantic oh. And then ELMA, which uh, the ESO has a stake in as well, so it's sort of higher up. So that's it, as you see, as you're going up there in the bus. It's got about 13 different telescopes that make up the whole observatory. One of those, actually just on the other side of the hill, was a radio telescope, which was part of the Event Horizon telescope. And we're going to have a look <coughs> inside this one, and we're going to have a look inside this one. Did you have any problems with the altitude yourself, Chris? An interesting question. <coughs> <coughs> interesting. <coughs> you walked around slowly, particularly, we went up acclimatised. We went up each day, came back down, went up a little bit higher, went down, so we took about five days to get to that altitude. Um, and we went up to about 14,500 feet was the highest altitude that we went up to. And as long as you just sort of walked around slowly, just took your time, you were fine. But I, I just always had this fascination with respiratory physiology, so I thought I'd do a little bit of an experiment. So I, I thought, and I like my running, so I thought I'd see how far I could run. I got literally about two or three started going up that. I got, Ugh! I just stopped oh. like a brick wall, just no air. I know how people, what they do when they're experiencing a heart attack. It was just an intense restriction and pain, and you're sitting there in full air, stopped, but gasping for air. There was no oxygen to, to inhale. Um, so it was a weird experience, so stopped me in my tracks. So it's, it's funny, if you're walking around casually, you're okay, but as soon as you go to exert yourself, you realise there's no reserve oxygen in the air. So it was a, that was quite, quite cool. I had some of the locals taught me that when you're walking around the summit, the money here is you, you just have the habit of like, when you breathe in, you have a big breath in, you yeah. hold, your, hold your breath for a second, you breathe out. Yes, yes, so yes. Yeah. And you drink lots of water because you oxygenate lots of water. Yes, yes, you're very thirsty too, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. I actually did try a little bit of a run. I was able to jog on the top of the morning here, so once again, I just couldn't help myself. I said, well, well, I can get away with that here. So I did. I actually got a little gentle jogging. But 
you know, these places no way. You know, they did about two, two or three strides, I should say strides, who were just, just stopped in the tracks. And the other benefit was that the astronomers would have their sessions mm -hmm. straight because you need what you want, fried food, whatever, because yes. your body burns off fast. Yes, yes. <laughs> they had big bags of the table. No, no, I can't touch that crap, you know, it's all those here. Oh, I was just pegged out on it. it was, they were just everywhere. You, you get hungry. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> and you're sure of oxygen, so you're having fun up there. The universe is one big party. <laughs> Just enjoy it. So here it is here. Oh, Um, so this was the Lucilla, the main 3.6 telescope, meter telescope, and its sole purpose is, is uh, looking for exoplanets around other stars, in particular by the radial velocity method. In other words, when a, when a planet's going on a star, a star or sun, that star has a little bit of a wobble, just sort of rebalancing its, its, its gravity and its, its orbit, so it's doing a subtle, subtle wobble. These telescopes can pick up a change in motion of a star coming away or going away by a degree of one metre per second. Now that's a walking pace. That's how good their spectroscopes, their high resolution, which I'm going to show you their high resolution spectroscopes in a minute. But their spectroscopes are stuff that the, the little change, the little Doppler effect in the wave, in the wave patterns coming towards us and going away from us, is a star, you know, a thousand odd light years away, is just doing a subtle wobble because of a planet going around it. These, these Instruments can pick up you know, up to one meter per second, just a walking pace difference between the star, the alteration in the wavelengths. And here we go. So this is the mountain cell in here. So that's the 3.6 meter, um, it's the second moon, the primary meter sits here. See, so I'm here, it's just standing here, which comes to down here. So it's, I've been moving the top of the meters here. So that gives you an idea, perspective, the sheer size of it. So this particular telescope, a lot of the instruments, most of these, all the Ritchie um, uh, Krikens, they're pretty much all, most professional telescopes are this particular optical design. Looks, of course, it looks like that one's on an equatorial mount, whereas the Keck is on the old Hazmuth mount. Yeah, now this is a, uh, you know, yeah, I think this was a, uh, an, an old Hazmuth. Most of them are all old Hazmuth. Oh, it just looks, yeah. the angle. I think so, like the instruments, equatorial. yeah. But the, the instrument here, they've got some big instruments down in the Cassegrain uh, focus. But you can just see the sheer size, size of the whole thing. When you see it up the hill from a distance, it doesn't look very big, but it is when you get in there. So it's the half slide. This is the, the, the main one, which I think they just they just called us the, the 3.6 the metres. Um, now, looking down from here now, we came out of there, and you looked down here, and you saw this big ramp that led up to the uh, new tip a new technology telescope that came into effect in 1989. It's one of the first telescopes to introduce adaptive optics. So that's that big square building in here you can see around. And uh, Kai, Larry, and myself from Canada, we, we actually went for a bit of we actually did manage to run, well, no, yeah, a bit of a slow, gentle jog up that little incline. 